So I over to Nani Singh ji. So it really is welcome and thank you for being here today. I'm Babu Singh, your host for this webinar. I know that today's topic will bring up a number of questions from you. So you may type your questions in chat box, and I want to let you know that we will address as many as we can in the time we have today. And I welcome and request our NDMS National Webinar Coordinator, Professor Dr. Soma Shekhar, to start this session. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Welcome all the students. Uh, I know one set of practical exams are over, and I hope uh, all of them have done well. Now the second year has become finally the exam going. Why I kept this practical is when I am an examiner, uh, both in the practicals and also evening in the viva when I ask, uh, what are the types of cytology used? What is Mekra, Jimsa stain? What is Pap? Pepinicol stain, what is a frozen section, how is it done, how should a specimen be sent, what is the temperature in the cryostat, at what millimeter do you cut in cryostat, nobody knows. Because, you know, as per the NBE, DNB, it is mandated that you get rotated and you work in histopathology, molecular pathology and see all this process, how it happens, what is... Uh, you know, uh, IHC and why, what is the stain color, is it a brown color on the slide and what are the main marker? Nobody visits, they all take it as a vacation posting. When we post you in medical oncology, radiation and pathology, it's a vacation. People just take it as a relaxation and they get caught in exam. So that's one of the reason I invited uh, senior oncopathologist, uh, Dr. Sushmita from Manipal Comprehensive Cancer Center to cover the practical aspect. She has painstakingly made small, small video of the entire procedure, machine, fixation process, everything. Please utilize this opportunity. She has spent a lot of personal time to prepare practical aspect for you. Not just the theory, but the practical. So please utilize this opportunity very well. Those of you who don't go, have not seen, don't understand, please look at it. And please ask all the doubts question you have from Dr. Sushmita. Sushmita, welcome. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and helping the DNB students. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot to DNB board for accepting that uh, for this uh, session for my talk. Thanks a lot, sir. So I will now continue uh, with the slideshow and hope the slides are of uh, usefulness to the students for their practical exams. Thank you, sir. So now a little bit of the history is that when we talk about pathology per se now in the present days, it all goes as back as to 1850 uh, uh, like that, that is the 18th century. And uh, most of it is with due respect to the surgeons who recognize that pathology or this on surgical oncopathology is a part of the team and also it has a huge role towards the management of the surgical outcome, which happens in an entire surgery, and surgery which the surgeon and especially the oncosurgeons take place. So without the appreciation or without this recognition, this pathology or surgical oncopathology would not have grown. And as old as uh, you can say uh, 1853, in the University of Paris, Dr. Hugh and Dr. Jonathan, they recognize that pathology has to be incorporated as a part of the uh, oncology uh, workup. And it roots as back as to 18th century where microscopic evaluation of the biopsy specimen was taken as importance. Before that, it was not taken, it was not there as a separate subject per se. And this intraoperative consultation of frozen sections was the uh, main uh, interest which uh, brought pathology as an important subject nowadays as we go through it. Now the first intraoperative section was done in the year 1851 and the case which on which it was done was a lumpectomy breast case and the surgeon required a frozen section to know whether the diagnosis of cancer was correct or not. So it was helping as a diagnostic tool for the surgeons in, in those days. 
and intraoperative frozen section was first done by pathologist William Welch on the request of William Helst, the chief of surgery. The cryostat method, which we do now, came into place in 1905. Before that, it was a robust procedure. You know, we had this liquid nitrogen cylinders, which was a big one, and then we had to tilt it in a 45 degrees with the floor. And then the liquid nitrogen used to come up through a pipe and um, then we had to take sections that, but that was very coarse. But nowadays with the new machines, we get very thin sections and that help us in our diagnosis also. Now, what are the indications for frozen section that you will be knowing as the surgeons? The first indication for the frozen section, be it written on the book or not, it is the surgeon's intuition whether he requires a frozen or not that is the first thing so so when a frozen section is taken it should be theoretically limited to this following indications but i'm telling you first it is always and always if the surgeon wants the frozen section then he can send any sample for frozen section to the histopathology department now Frozen section provides a diagnosis that allows the surgeon to make an intraoperative decision, deciding that whether further surgery is required during that operative event or not. Sometimes it can be taken to assess a benign tumor or where he thinks this could be benign, this can be borderline in case of ovary or it can be a malignant lesion also. Now, for another uh, case or uh, another case, um, series of cases which we usually take up in our institution is the lumpectomy specimens for BCS surgeries to assess the margins. So where the intraoperative frozen section report, if it comes positive, will help the surgeon to decide, okay, we can take another deeper margin so that we will get a negative margin for this case. So that is a practical utility which we regularly use in our institution and I hope in most of the places where they are using frozen section, this is one of the primary indication of using the frozens. And then it can be used as a uh, to assess whether the biopsy specimen which is being taken is from the lesion of interest or we are uh, no, no, still at the periphery of the lesion. This mostly goes uh, for those areas like when we want to take a bone biopsy for any bone lesion. So because bone being, uh, you know, the, you have the uh, superficial or the cortical part of the bone. So that is on the periphery, on the outer surface. So if it comes from the outer surface or from the cortical part, then we will not be able to give the correct diagnosis. So the surgeon needs to know whether he is in, in the lesion. So that is one aspect. And mostly nowadays what we do is for the stereotactic brain tumors. So the, the surgeon needs to know whether he is in the lesion or he is still in the glial component only. So these are some of the aspects where you need it as a diagnostic tissue biopsy. Apart from them, we sometimes get lymph nodes where it can be of you know, you have uh, inflammatory etiology of infective etiology, like we can see granulomas, we can see some fungal filaments. So that time, this is a fresh tissue which we are assessing. So what happens, part of the tissue can be sent to microbiology department to do the culture, to do the PCR study on them. So you need not again take a fresh sample from the patient to send separately to the microbiology department after the biopsy report comes. So from the same specimen, we can give the sample to microbiology department for doing further tests on that. And next we can definitely work up the specimen which we get from uh, the uh, OT for uh, further workup. Further workup means nowadays, it is an era of molecular diagnosis. So what we can do, we can preserve some of this tissue, sent for cytogenetics, we can send for flow cytometry, and we can also send for the molecular lab for different other tests if they require. And in higher centers where they have a like no um, protocol or they have the provision for tissue banking, 
there we can preserve this tissue. So later, if we want to do any molecular studies, any cytogenetics, it can be done. And then this can be a plan for resource for the surgeon in, in one way is that the surgeon sends a tissue and then he waits for the second phase of the surgery. Like for example, if you are doing a sentinel node dissection, so if the tissue comes positive, if the node is positive, then the surgeon can plan for the axillary node dissection. So it can be a second phase plan for the surgeons that what he needs to do or what he will plan for his total surgical outcome for that case. Now the frozen section turnaround time according to the caps uh, from the American board is about uh, 20 minutes. This time is from the receiving of the specimen to the lab. That is uh, where we are getting the sample for processing. The transit time from the operation theater to the lab is not included in the turnaround time. It is only from the receiving, from the time we are fixing the tissue and we are examining and giving the report. So it should be a total about 15 minutes for processing and another five minutes for reporting. So it can be as less as 10 minutes to 20 minutes. So that is only for per tissue biopsy which we are getting. It, it does not include the entire series of tissue samples which may be done for the same case or not. Now what are some of the errors which we face while doing the frozen section? That can be because you know the type of tissue we get. We sometimes get error because of even the type of tissue. Sometimes if the tissue is very hard, very difficult to cut. Suppose when uh, the surgeon sends a very hard tissue, maybe it's a calcified tissue. So what happens, the cryostat is having a very, uh, like it's a cryofixation, like very rapid fixation. In that, to soften this hard tissue, there is no option. Usually in a routine process for softening the hard tissue, we do a soft decal in acid. So here we don't have the provision. So what happens if it is a very hard tissue, we are not able to cut the section. Or even if we cut, it gets very thick sections, folded sections. So that becomes a problem. Uh, but that is a problem because of this entire process of uh, cryostat uh, processing. And then there can be some sampling error. Like suppose we are taking sectioning from the uh, lymph node. Now we take multiple micro sections, like one lymph node we cut into two to three mm multiple serial red loaf like sections. So in that when we are trimming and making the sectioning, it uh, maybe in the first sections which we are examining and doing this intraoperative um, examination, the micro foci of metastatic deposits, which can be about uh, maybe a less than 200 cells, maybe sometimes a 10 cells may not be, you know, uh, revealed on this first sections which we have done. So later in permanent, when we are taking some more deeper sections, that time we can get microscopic foci. So that is one of, uh, you know, a fallacy of this because sometimes as a pathologist, if it is a small node, we want to preserve it for paraffin also because on the paraffin, we will need even to do IHC for the molecular or not. So we uh, try to about preserve half the percent of the uh, tissue sample which we get in the frozen. So in a um, way to uh, preserve tissue, sometimes we don't exhaust, we don't utilize the entire tissue. So maybe the deeper sections, sometimes if we get positive, becomes a sampling error. And it is also, you can say in one way, it is a diagnostic error too. So that is some of the uh, frozen section errors, which we can uh, sometimes face. And one last, uh, but not the least, or it usually never happened in my practice is a communication error in the diagnosis. Because sometimes when we tell uh, it is, uh, positive uh, case it may be negative or negative may be positive because maybe uh, you have you could not reach out to the doctor the concerned surgeon you have conveyed it to uh, a student or nurse so she may she may not be knowing the importance of this or the terminologies so sometimes uh, this there can be a misconveying of 
the re result of the frozen section which has been you know um, conveyed to the surgeon so here is a small video for how we get frozen section in our department so this is a container which we get uh, in which we get frozen section so here you can see that the sample which we get is fresh fresh by uh, what i mean by fresh is that there is no fixative added in the container so i have poured you so it is only a tissue piece which is uh, fresh which is grayish yellow or grayish brown in color and it uh, is not put in either water normal saline or formalin so now first when we get the tissue we get a form of uh, where it is written the details of the tissue we check with the container we check with the form and then we take the tissue and we see for how the tissue looks like on palpation whether it is hard now this is a container where it is no fixation is added to the uh, sample it is fresh now we examine for where how the uh, tissue free feels whether it is firm whether it is necrotic then we will take the dimension of the tissue piece here we can see it is a flat tissue piece we have, we have to take three dimensional uh, measurement that is length width and the breadth and then we assess for how the tissue feels whether it is firm whether it is necrotic whether there is any growth and how it looks whether it is whitish in color it has any hemorrhagic areas here this was sent from a gallbladder bed where the surgeon was uh, wanted to assess this area of um, thickness so after assessing we see whether the scalpel blade has been um, firmly fixed or not if we have any doubt then we change the blade and again see whether the blade has been firmly fixed with the scalpel uh, holder and then with the scalpel blade we will make serial bread loaf sections for the specimen which we receive for examination here you see i am palpating and seeing for any obvious uh, necrotic areas or not now we are doing serial bread loaf sectioning the sections are very thin about 3 mm to 5 mm and we will do serial sectioning of the entire tissue piece and entirely we give the tissues the which is the cut section this here this is the cutting surface so when we this is a cutting surface so when we do take these sections for cryostat or for cryo uh, like you no know, for fixation in the frozen machine we have to see or ask our technician that which surface we have cut that should be the cutting surface what is the cutting surface means when i will be examining it when the pathologist will be examining the section in the microscope under the microscope then she will see this cut surface on this slide because that is the surface of interest not this surface it is always the cutting surface so we tell them cutting embedding that means the cut surface should be the embedding surface also so i'm taking multiple section here are the cassettes on which we will put the sections you can see we are putting the sections in these cassettes now these cassettes will be taken for cutting under the cryostat now cryostat processing will start now this is a frozen section machine this is known as a cryostat so here we are
putting the freezing media on the tissue. The tissues are sent or uh, you know placed on these chucks, and we are using the tissue freezing media so that the tissue will be fixed and it will become hard so that we will be able to cut it and staining will be done accordingly and then we can examine the tissue under the microscope. So this is the tissue piece. These are the chucks on which we use. And this is the freezing media added. Here also you can see the freezing media is added. And then we wait for to harden, um, wait for about four to five minutes so that the tissue will get hard. And we press with forceps so that even surface is attained. We will check for hardness of the tissue from time to time. And the temperature you can see it is about a minus 25. Usually there is a range. It can be from minus 25 to minus 28. Now once the tissue is fixed, it is becoming firm. We will take for cutting on this cryostat. So we are taking the chucks and fixing with the uh, knob. You can see here. This is, the tissue is fixed. So when the tissue is fixed on the cryostat with the freezing media, the freezing media looks white and the tissue looks yellowish uh, red or reddish yellow in color. And this is the cutting blade. So we will be doing the cutting process now. First we trim the tissue block so that we get an even surface for cutting and we will get even sectioning so that you know we will get less knife mark less serrations so we get a very clear picture of the lesion we want to examine so you see now the tissue has become hard and we are taking thin sections these sections are about two to three microns thin only So it is a two to three microns thin sections. Now we stain the slides in hematoxylin. This is a blue color stain, which gives your nuclear a purplish blue color. So here we keep it for two minutes. Then we are washing in running water. So running water helps in blueing of the uh, stain. That means the nucleus will be taking the bluish purple color. And after uh, washing, we will put in eosin. After hematoxylin, we wash and then again put in eosin. Eosin gives the eosinophilic or the uh, reddish pink color of the cytoplasm. So after eosin, uh, in eosin, we keep about a 40, uh, about a 80, uh, 8 seconds. And then we will uh, wash and then clear in phases of alcohol. These are all 70% alcohol. And then we clear in xylene which is also a clearing agent because if the sections are not cleared we will not be able to see under the microscope so after clearing now we will be mounting the sections in dps and this is how we get the slides again same video coming I think uh, this is the next uh, frozen section. This is a lumpectomy specimen. This is a lumpectomy sent for us. It is a BCS specimen. This is the skin surface, which is here we can see two marked cross area. The skin surface is an elliptical shaped uh, piece of skin tissue. Usually the skin is the anterior. This was a lumpectomy from the left breast with two sutures given. By protocol, the short suture is uh, for superior margin and the long is for lateral margin. See, we are assessing 
for the uh, entire specimen. We will first see the specimen properly. Here is the superior suture short, and then we have the lateral long suture. It is a left sided, so here you can see this is a long suture marking towards the left. So the, when we take the margins, so we will assess this is a long lateral margin. So opposite to the lateral, this side will be the medial margin. Then this is superior. So opposite to superior will be my inferior margin. And then this was a skin which was facing anteriorly. So that was um, anterior. And here opposite to anterior where I'm putting the thumb is the base or the posterior margin. So first when we get the specimen, we assess thoroughly and we palpate to see whether in which area it feels more firm. So that area will be the lesion or the tumor. So here the lateral uh, margin we are assessing and after seeing the specimen thoroughly, we have to ink or paint the entire specimen with India ink. So that when we are taking the sections, if any part it is very close to the uh, margin, we can tell the surgeon, okay, it is very close and you need a revision. Medial, superior, inferior, anterior skin margin, and this is the posterior error base. So now we will ink the entire specimen. And we are measuring the specimen after uh, thorough examination of the specimen in three dimensions. That is uh, length about uh, nine centimeters. You can see. Then we take the breadth and the width of the entire specimen. here then we take even the skin part, skin uh, flap measurement also now i'm painting here with india ink and now after painting we need to fix the paint with glacial acetic acid otherwise in washing the paint will uh, be washed off so we wash and fix the paint on the uh, specimen otherwise this um, while cutting the paint will go while washing also it will get removed and then we nicely uh, clean off the extra paint otherwise it will penetrate the tissue and cause uh, fault paint in the uh, tissue sections and now we will same we will cut the <coughs> sections from the margins in a perpendicular that is radial margins. So here is the suture, the orientation suture, that is the lat from the lateral margin. So we are going perpendicular and taking radial margin so that if anywhere the tumor is close, we can uh, assess on the frozen sections. So here we are cutting into bread loaf uh, sectioning. So every section here, you can see we have made several slices. This is one slice, this is the next slice. So this is called as bread loaf slicing. And it is about a three to five mm thickness only. And then we assess for the tumor or how the entire specimen looks like. And on filling, we can make out which is the area of interest. So that is very important. A pathologist should be knowing which is the area of interest. So here we need a lot of experience to even assess which areas should be examined in the specimen. So here it is a, a post NSCT specimen of uh, breast carcinoma. And here we are seeing that entire is a gray white tumor bed area. So we measure that tumor bed area in 
three dimensions. And then we take the distances of this gray white tumor bed area from the inked peripheral margin. See, from the inferior, we are taking the margins from superior, from lateral, medial, and from base. So here uh, we were seeing the gray white tumor bed area. So this was a pinked peripheral surface um, which was painted. So we are marking or measuring that this is a white area which could be a possible lesion. From there, how much away is the inked periphery? So that would help us to get a clear picture of the distance of the uh, free areas. So we are taking the distances and that all these distances and findings we record in the request form which is provided by the surgeon and these are the sections which are being given. <coughs> well, this is another case which uh, we didn't take a frozen. Um, like, uh, sorry, we didn't take a video, but it is a case which I just uh, recently have received just to show as a reminder what steps we have done till now. That is, here we get the sample with no fixative, just fresh in the container. We put it on the crossing tray and then we take cereal bread, uh, bread slicing. Here we have opened the specimen and we have serially sliced in bread loaf manner. Now, here, as I was telling, we should know from which area to take the section. So you can see this is a tumor, but this is the normal ovary. This is a large ovarian mass. This is the solid cystic part of the ovary, which is showing the tumor glossy. But here, the periphery is a benign ovarian tissue. So this assessment should be there. So from where to sample? So to, for diagnosis or for the frozen section, we should take from this area, which is of interest, which is showing the tumor. We should not sample the benign area. Then we will give a fault wrong report to the surgeons. And then we take the representative sections. Now, this is what we get as slides. And I was telling you, we cut multiple section in small, small section of each node. So one node we will make about 10 sections and then we will examine under the microscope. This is what how a section looks when it is submitted after the uh, you know staining. And this is what we see in the microscopy. This was the ovarian tumor which we had sampled and this is the high uh, on the microscopic picture which we examine and see it showed features of a high grade tumor, high grade serous uh, carcinoma it was on the morphology. So now the cryostat we can see this is a Leica make and you can see the temperature here is about minus 25 but the range is about minus 24 to minus 27 minus 28 so it has to be in that range and before functioning we should see uh, whether the cryostat is clean and after every process we will be cleaning the entire cryostat so that it is ready for the ne next surgical oncol specimen. And now the parts of the cryostat. This was the tissue shelf where we were keeping the tissue for freezing. And then this is a rotary microtome where we were after this tissue which was processed and hardened in chucks we place here in this rotatory microtome for cutting into thin sections and here we had seen the blade with which we were making thin sections and then we were taking the slice on this anti-roll plate so that it gives a clean unfolded sections. Now what things we uh, need to remember while sending a frozen section to the lab is that always it has to be sent fresh with no fixative. 
nos align. What happens if this sentence align is that saline causes fixation artifact. That is which section I have shown you it had a smooth uh, um, field. But if we have a saline fixed tissue, in that we will see many of the areas, no? it is as if there is no tissue, as if there is fold in the sections. So that when that um, hampers in the microscopy when we were assessing the sections. And very crucial information is that the request form should be duly filled. That is, on the top, it should be mentioned frozen section. Otherwise, the person in the receiving area will not know that is sent for frozen section. So, on the request form, frozen section should be mentioned. And then another thing very important is the surgeon's name should be mentioned on the request form with the number so that we need, as soon as we get the report or as soon as we examine the sections, we can instantly call him and tell, okay, this is the findings uh, for the case which you have sent. And not the least, the request form should have like all the clinical details pertaining to the case. That is the radiological findings, especially in uh, case of bone tumors and uh, you know the brain tumors, the gliomas, we need to have the MRI findings. And then if it is a case of ovarian tumors or pelvic masses of uh, where we didn't know the origin. So for those cases, we need to know serum tumor markers and we need to know whether CA125 level is increased or not. So all, all this valuable information will be needed to, uh, the, uh, to be given or provided to the pathologist. Because pathologist, you are the eye for the pathologist, like the surgeons. So without the valuable input of the surgeons will not be able to make the correct diagnosis while assessing the sections for microscopy and for the further reporting. Now next we uh, will go to the fine needle aspiration or FNAC which we do very often for uh, the patients coming with any visible lump. So now a uh, very uh, Critical part is the history and previous to that we have to take uh, like consent from the patient that we are doing the procedure on him and after the consent we can examine the site of the swelling, how big is the lesion. So this is important because if for in pathology department we usually do superficial palpable FNAC or it is called as a palpation FNAC, mostly like you know, superficial lumps, thyroid, if only when the size of the lesion is more than two centimeters, where we can firmly fix the sorry lesion in between our two fingers, and then we can take the aspirate sample. So mainly it is for your thyroid and for the lymph nodes, that also the superficial nodes, the neck nodes. And while doing so, we should also, uh, like while examining the patient, we should ask for all the um, complaints, the duration, whether we have done any previous FNAC uh, was done for the patient or not. And for thyroid, we need the USG findings. All these things should be asked to the patient and uh, also any bleeding disorder. If uh, it is there, then better we don't do a uh, FNAC on the uh, pathology lab. It should the FNAC should be done under proper counseling and in the intervention radiology department only. Now we need to prepare the patient as uh, that we are all aware of. We have to clean the area and then take a uh, do the FNAC procedure. So once uh, we prepare the patient, we uh, fix the thumb and then we draw the sample uh, with the needle. Uh, we use a handle for that and with negative pressure we aspirate the material on the slide and uh, routinely we make a three to four slide and the slides made should be well flame shaped uh, smears and as soon as we make the smear we should put in alcohol only when we think we need the sections for you know ZN staining then we need to keep one air dried to do the uh, ZN staining for acid fast bacilli. Otherwise, if we need for to exclude whether there is a malignancy or whether uh, we need it for routine examination to know the type of the lesion, then we need alcohol fixed smears. And here we have to have immediate dip in the alcohol jar. 
here we are uh, doing cleaning the FNSC um, area, like where the site of FNSC from where we have to do that lump area has been cleaned with swab. And then we introduce the uh, needle with the handle, the plunger. And with creating negative pressure, we aspirate the material on the cleaned glass slides. And as soon as we make the smear, we have to put in this coupling jars, which cause, which have alcohol in them. So some steps, as we have already discussed, and now uh, it's been uh, just summarized here that we need a alcohol, uh, a clean area with alcohol swab, and then we uh, press the swelling and uh, um, fix it with two fingers and then introduce the needle and then with to and fro direction this is also very important to and fro direction in all different directions should be assessed and sampling should be done and if you see when we are doing from very cystic lesion then always please do not go to the center of the lesion while doing the FNAC, you should do from the periphery of the lesion. And you should understand while doing is that on the periphery of the lesion, you should feel the gritty sensation. That means you have reached the periphery of the lesion. Then only we will get adequate material. Otherwise, if we take from the center of the lesion, we will uh, get a lot of necrotic material. We can get uh, cystic fluid material if the lesion is very cystic. So we need to go to the periphery and then do adequate sampling. For... Uh, Cases like thyroid, FNS is very helpful. Now, for this, if when we are doing FNSE, if we see that we are getting brown, thin, uh, material, then we need to aspirate again uh, and uh, see that the material which we are getting is now uh, having a granular appearance. So we need to maybe revisit or do the sampling twice. Otherwise, it will get uh, like, no, whether we will have to report it as uh, the sample is not adequate. So we need to assess whether the smears which we have taken is not hemorrhagic. It has granular material. So when we get granular material, we can be assured that we have taken good sample of the FNAC aspirate. Nowadays, uh, like previously, we used to do FNAC for lesions, maybe from breast or um, some, um, you know, soft tissue swelling. But this are not encouraged nowadays because we need tissue biopsy for breast carcinomas, tissue biopsy for uh, your um, soft tissue lesions. So when we get tissue biopsies, that will help us to do further testing. So nowadays, FNAC is, uh, you can say, quite limited to uh, lesions of thyroid, limited to superficial lesions. I think it could be an in infective or inflammatory lesion. And not to be used for breast carcinomas, lung carcinomas, where we need the tissue biopsy for doing the immunohistochemistry and molecular testing. So now we are just running through the entire process once more. We are the sample. We are making the smear. Smear should be flame shipped. And as soon as we are making the smear, immediately we have to put it in the alcohol jar so that we don't get any drying artifact. Nowadays, uh, we do a lot of cell block or cell button preparation from the FNAC aspirate material. So you saw with the um, aspirate, we made four or five smears, but remaining we have put in this formalin. So you can see uh, after putting in formalin, we are getting the sediment. With the sediment, we can make a cell button. So this cell button we can use for doing further test. So this is a smear of a fluid which was positive. We can see this hyperchromatic cells which are in clusters and in singly scattered lying in this field. And this cells, you can see the cytoplasm is having a vacillated um, look. And you can see the nucleus of the periphery. So this is happy, having a signet ring-like appearance. So these are signet cells. Here is another view of the cell block of the same which we have taken. This was a smear. This was a cell block made. And on the cell block, we have run immunohistochemistry. It is showing 
CK7, uh, which is diffuse strong positive, and we can see scattered uh, CK20. So mostly this was a fluid from a 85 year old uh, lady with uh, effusion, and uh, we on this strong CK7 positive. After uh, seeing this slide, we could tell the uh, clinician that it could be a, a case of carcinoma stomach or a workup for the upper GI has to be done for uh, this patient because this patient had come with uh, pleural effusion and uh, there was no workup for this patient done. So this helps us in the second like, no, line of treatment, which will help for the clinician to now evaluate for any stomach remedy or not. So that way it helps in uh, rapid, uh, you know, you can guide the clinician what evaluation has to be done for the patient next. After FNAC, we'll just uh, take you through the processing of the tissue in the histopathology lab. So this is a crossing station. So we receive the samples and then we uh, fix the tissue in formalin and then we do crossing of the samples and then we do processing of the uh, tissues in the tissue processor and the processing of the tissue consists of three steps that is dehydration, clearing and impregnation where we will uh, see that it becomes firm and we can do the remaining test and we can cut the slides also. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, I'm uh, seeing some uh, of the questions appearing on my screen. So can I take them uh, later after the whole uh, Presentation or I can I no, no, after, after full after complete the presentation. Okay, sir. So now uh, we are doing uh, going through the grossing of the uh, specimens. So here it is a hysterectomy uh, specimen which was sent to us, and uh, we first take the measurement and then. We will take the representative sections. So this is the endometrial cavity. We took the length. Now this is the endometrial thickness which we are assessing. And then we'll see if there is any visible growth. Here the endometrium is looking little thickened at the fundus here. So we will take multiple sections from here and put them into these cassettes. The sections should be very thin, about a 3 mm thickness. So the thinner the sections, it helps in better penetration of the formalin for fixation. So when we uh, cut thinner sections and process them, it is processed better and the slides which we receive from them gives a, a you know clean view for the entire lesion. So we are taking multiple sections from this area which is little, uh, looking a little thickened at the fundus. And then we will put into multiple cassettes. So for every case, we take about 20 to 30 sections so that we don't miss out on any of the important diagnostic points like about if it is a malignant uh, tumor. So we have to assess on the, here you can see there is a growth here in the fundus. So we are suspecting there can be a endometrial carcinoma in this case. It is uh, It was sent from outside hospital. So here the growth, we can see a polypoid protruding lesion and there is some irregular areas. So we are assessing more sections from this area 
about uh, uh, we have taken out 15 sections from this and we take more sections to assess how much if there is a tumor what is the depth of penetration because for endometrial carcinomas we have to first how do we assess that is we first take the entire depth of the endometrium then if this is the lesion so whether it has gone more than 50 percent of the myometrium whether we are seeing anything on the cirrhosa here the cirrhosa cirrhosal aspect is clear there is no deposit and then whether uh, it is less than 50 percent or whether more than 50 percent so we have to assess multiple sections and so that in the permanent report we give a comprehensive good report to the surgeon which will be helpful for treating the patient forward and more sectioning helps us to comment on whether we have uh, lymphovascular emboli and also if there are areas of necrosis to comment on now uh, the steps in fixation fixation is a very very valuable step in the entire histopathology uh, decision making or making the slide the first thing is fixation so uh, we need to run through the steps for fixation that is first it helps to why fixation is required fixation helps to maintain the tissue in its original state that means the state in which we want to examine the slides we want to examine the tissue if the tissue is not properly fixed first of all it will get autolyzed that means we will not be able to see any cellular morphology when the slides are cut so that is one main problem which any pathology lab faces when the uh, you know the sample is not from in house the sample is from other hospitals so what happens they may not have properly fixed the tissue they may not have cut the tissue while sending uh, they the amount of formalin maybe percentage or maybe the quantity is not enough for the tissue fixation so many times when we get this sort of um, samples from outside they are inadequately fixed and later it becomes very difficult for us to give a proper diagnosis so tissue fixation is the mainstay for any good histological lab for uh, giving correct diagnosis so now what are the aims so aims as we already discussed is to preserve the tissue to its nearest living state how it will be looking then to prevent for any change in size or shape of the tissue that is in the cellular level and for the um, like you know for processing it should prevent any autolysis it should make the tissue firm but not too hard means it should not be you know the formalin concentration should not be very high so then it makes the tissue very brittle and firm and also it causes later to uh, loss of antigenicity so when we uh, get tissue which are less fixed autolyzed or causing um, you know fixation artifact in those cases later there can be a loss of antigenicity and we will not be able to do our immunohistochemical stay uh, stains properly we cannot do the molecular test also properly and also likewise if the formalin concentration is too high then also it causes firm it causes the tissue to become brittle so uh, less fixation and over fixation should be prevented we should fix the tissue in 10 percent formalin and uh, the tissue should be fixed in about 10 to 20 times the fluid to its uh, volume so that is an adequate fixative added when we are uh, you know cutting and fixing the specimens and this uh, fixation also helps to prevent any bacterial growth in the tissue it helps to have a very clear stain as we were telling and to have a quality uh, of uh, uh, slide stained uh, staining um, what we see on examination so always the fixation step is very very important and what is the ideal fixative ideal fixative here we take 
across the world as formalin because it is uh, a cheap one it is non toxic it uh, can be used readily and uh, you know it is very readily available so whenever we use anything for processing it should be some chemical or um, substance which is very readily available and very easy to use so that way formalin is across the world the ideal fixative for routine histochemical steams now the essential precaution for fixation as we discussed before that it should be free from like when we are fixing is that the tissue should be free from excessive blood before putting into the fixative so as a protocol what we follow here in our department is when we get a tissue from the ot we presume that it must be having uh, blood uh, while the tissue was being transferred in the fixative so what we do as soon as we get we cut the tissue into desired bread loaf and then put it wash the tissue properly in water and then put it into formalin so what happens in that we by this step we free the tissue from added blood so that it can be properly fixed and then for all surgical oncology specimen it we uh, prefer that it should be cut immediately as soon as possible so what is the advantage of that so if we cut the tissue especially when it is a onco surgical uh, surgical specimen that means the tissue which is sampled has the tumor if a leak is made through the tumor just through the tumor and we do not distort the specimen what happens that reduces the cold ischemic timing so now cold ischemic timing as uh, for good um, you know um, staining for ihc or molecular testing it should be a less than as less than 45 minutes it can be usually we take maybe a 1 hour or uh, two hour can be taken into consideration to keep the tissue in formalin but what happens if we uh, delay transferring of the tissue into the fixative solution or if we delay the uh, fixative agent to reach the tumor more than 45 minutes then the cold ischemic time increases and so what happens when we do molecular testing when we do immunohistochemical Uh, chemistry on this sections uh, stains which are very sensitive like hertenu like pr it decides on your later uh, you know the treatment protocol for breast cancers for gi the cold ischemic time if it is prolonged then it causes a uh, hamper it causes does not allow the uh, antigen antigen uh, antibody reaction so there can be a loss of antigenicity because of delayed cold ischemic time so to prevent those in this uh, time of molecular testing we would like the cold ischemic time should be reduced as minimum as possible so if it is less than half an hour to 45 minutes it is the most desirable one so we always tell our um, surgical onco team and other um, hospitals that please do put the specimen as soon as it is out with a small nick through the tumor on palpation which is the most firm part of the specimen so that what happens no immediate formalin penetration happens so this is a very valuable or a, a thought which you should always keep in mind that we have to put the specimen as soon as possible so into the fixative so that it we can minimize the cold ischemia time and hence our further test the immunohistochemistry the molecular testing can be done efficiently on this uh, tissue because we know the tissue for immunohistochemistry or for molecular those tests are very costly test and those tests are very deciding for your case to decide on the second or third level of uh, you know the treatment which you will decide for the patient for that the basic fixation really matters so if we from now if we start practicing that fixation is really very very uh, essential part of any surgical onco specimen and if we keep in mind that we have to nick it as soon as possible then i think that across 
departments, we can really reduce this cold ischemic uh, time changes associated with it and we will really get very good tissue harvested for our immunohistochemistry and the molecular testing from now. So now the tissue, uh, as I have told, we have to cut it in red loaf, serially in 3 to 5 mm thickness. And the fixative or the formalin which we are using here should be about 10 to 20 times more than the volume of the tissue. And this should be sent in tightly screwed kept bottle, it means that bottle or the container should have a tight cap. Now, what are the aims of processing? The processing consists of three steps, that is a dehydration, clearing and impregnation. Now, what is dehydration? So, dehydration is the water part from the tissue has to be removed. So, that is what dehydration serves. And then after dehydration, we have to clear the, um, the clearing has to be done so that later when we examine the slide under microscope, it should be transparent and we can see a clear view. And impregnation is when we make the tissue into a hard, uh, you know, block. So it helps us in cutting. So that is what is the purpose of impregnation. So the basic aim of tissue processing is to provide sufficient rigidity or sufficient firmness to the tissue so that it can be cut into thin sections for microscopic examination. For the steps of processing, we have already uh, gone through it. So now this is the tissue processors which we use. We use uh, two processors. This is for large oncology specimens, uh, which has a capacity of about 200 to 250 blocks. And then this is a smaller uh, capacity tissue processor, but this we keep for only our core biopsies, so that this has a lesser programming time. So we get our core biopsies earlier. And because our large tissues, which is a surgical oncology specimen, we need more timing for fixing and processing, we use the uh, larger capacity uh, processor. Now, processing the tissue bits in the histopathology lab, it goes through a series of fixative agents, that is alcohol, graded alcohol, about 50%, 70%, 90%, and 100%. And then we go through xylene, which is a clearing agent. So the first is graded alcohol and this helps in dehydration, that is removing the water. Then we have to clear the tissue, that is we use a clearing agent, that is a xylene, and then we have to embed, that is we have to make the tissue firm, that is we run the tissue through paraffin jars and each run is about one to two hours. And uh, after doing the processing, we get the tissue the next morning for cutting and then we can get the slides for examining the next day. So it is a, like an overnight process and uh, it takes about uh, 19 and a half hours to 21 hours on, depending on the time and also depending on the tissue which we are putting. So for the small biopsies, we take a 19 and a half hours. And when we do the oncology specimen, the larger, we uh, have programmed it about a 21 uh, hours like that. But it always depends on your uh, load of your institution and the equipment which you're using. So your, uh, here we are using a Leica processor. So the engineer from Leica comes and gives us the training and we assess multiple sections, multiple tissue, and we see which program suits us. It is not that uh, we have written one hour, uh, it is usually one hour across. Sometimes in some areas we may need alcohol one and a half hours. I will just show you what we have programmed and kept. So minimum one hour, it can be one and a half hours also. And that way we set the programming as far, which is gives us the best result not which is written in the books. It is, I'm, I'm telling you, it is as your institute or your lab has uh, 
after multiple testing has um, set as a protocol. So here uh, we'll just see the tissue processor. See, we are loading the cassettes, which already in grossing, uh, we have seen we keep the tissue in the cassettes. So we load those cassettes in these jars. Now it is in formalin. First phase is the formalin. So we will keep ours in formalin first. And here we already have a set program given, uh, tested and given by the company, which we have tested and, uh, you know, uh, we have standardized for our institute. So it is one hour, one and a half hours. And the entire processing takes place overnight. Now, after the tissue processing, we take the tissue out the next day morning. So if usually we close uh, our processing by six o'clock in the evening, five o'clock for the uh, oncology large cases and six o'clock for the smaller cases. So we wait for, you know, the core biopsies if any for the radiology department is coming or not. So we wait one or more and then uh, start the smaller processor. So morning we get the blocks or the tissue, which is overnight fixed and ready uh, after processed. So now those processed tissue, we embed them in wax, make them a mold, and this mold gives the firmness to the tissue so that uh, it prevents for distortion of the tissue during cutting, and it helps us to examine the tissue for archival use. And the embedding medium which we use for routine histopathology is paraffin wax. And if uh, tissue has been sent for you know, electron microscopy, uh, another medium which can be used or which is used is epoxy resin. Paraffin is the commonly used embedding medium. So here we are making blocks uh, from uh, the overnight um, uh, tissue which has been processed. So grossing cas uh, cassettes which has been grossed has been processed overnight. And here we can see the cassettes are being placed. This is a embedding machine. And this, you can see this is a Leica embedding machine. Here is a rack which holds molten wax. So paraffin wax, which we will be using for doing embedding of these tissues. So here you can see these are the cassettes. And we are embedding it in this mold, in the steel molds. This molten wax which is being stored in the wax tank through this nozzle it comes and it flows here you can see here this is the nozzle from where molten wax comes and we can pour in this steel molds so this is the tank from where the wax comes we pour the wax into the tissue uh, molds here we are making the block and these are blocks made. So this is just an overview of the uh, embedding machine. <clears throat> this is a cold plate from where uh, the tissue blocks which we have taken out from the tissue uh, processor which is hot has to be cold, has to get cooled down and also has to be a uh, little firm, be firm. So from the cold plate we transfer to the hot plate. Hot plate we pour the molten wax as we have showed you. Here it is a warmer and then we make the blocks. Here these are the blocks we have embedded and we have made. This and we will now do the cutting. This is the blocks made and this is a microtome where we do the cutting. See this, we have um, fixed this block and now we are cutting into thin sections. How thin are the sections? The thin sections are 3 microns thin. So now we have fixed the block. You saw how we are cutting the sections. Once the sections are cut, the sections are floated 
so that the sections when we see on the slide do not have any folds, any crimps on that. So after floating, the sections are now placed on the slides. Now the slides are has to be stained. So with our um, load, we have a auto stainer because so every may, day. A little bit have to rush up. We have overshot time by twenty minutes, and little questions are there. Little, can you? Yes. Yeah. So, so this is auto stainer, and this is what we get after uh, the staining. This is the hematoxylin and eosin stain slides. And now this is immunohistochemistry where we see uh, this is an antigen antibody uh, reaction. So the tissue which we get is the antigen on the tissue which has to be preserved and which we have done adequately uh, after doing the fixation. And uh, we, when we do the immunohistochemistry, which is the basic thing is the antigen antibody reaction. So we put the antibody and this will react with the antigen of the tissue and that gives us uh, the IHC or the immunohistochemistry staining and uh, which is the basis of it and when we add the antibody it gives the desired brown coloration for the specific antigens. Now this is our Vantana machine, IHC machine. This is a programming which we have preset as per every uh, stain, every suppose it is an ER will have a definite time program. So it is already set. So we have to uh, put the slides across in this IHC machine. So the steps are deparaffinization, dehydration, antigen retrieval, blocking with endogenous enzyme, blocking non-specific binding, incubation, primary antibody, then we give the secondary antibody, and then the chromogen, that is the antibodies which we get for the um, desired stain which we want. Suppose if it is a ER, we have to, the chromogen will be ER, we add here and we get the desired brown uh, coloration for the desired test. So this is a tissue on which we can do the IHC, that is a formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue and also we can do on cell block, which has shown. This is the various steps of IHC. This is a program starting, we are putting the antibody, this is a 30 capacity slides. This is the antigen, uh, like antigen which we want to put. There are different anti, uh, the antigen racks. So we have uh, all the antigen which we will be doing that day, we will be putting on the rack and then we will start the machine. This is a program which is a preset program. So this is how we take uh, the antibodies and add on the slides. And then uh, after we keep for one and a half hours, we get the slides ready for interpretation. So these are some of the major applications which we uh, do on immunohistochemistry. That is the classification of tumors. It helps us to differentiate between the carcinoma, sarcoma, melanoma, etc. For lung carcinomas, routinely we do uh, to differentiate a squamous, adeno, and small cell with the specific staining pattern, um, antibodies. And then uh, for prognosis, we also use IHC markers. Like for breast cases, we use the hormone markers, ERP or Continue for prognostic markers. We use a KI nowadays. We are even using a PDL ones. Some frequently use IHC panels for breast carcinoma. We use uh, frequently ERP or HER2 new and KI in our uh, um, organization. For neuroendocrine panel, we use a sign up to chromocity 56 and KI, which is a proliferation marker. For GIST, we use CD117 and DOG1, which are specific markers. For spinal cell tumors, we can use the entire. A panel, SMA 100, Desmin, Caldes 1. If it is a uh, leomyomas, sarcomas, leomyomas, this stain will help us. If it is a gist, that CD117 and DOG1. If it is a Sanovia sarcoma, TLE uh, 1 helps. Now, some basic panels to differentiate brown cell tumors, like if the Ewing spinet, we need a CD99. If it is a Wim's tumor, we do a set, uh, sorry, if it is a, like Wim's tumor, we will do a WT. Uh, Positivity we will get, we get a CK positivity and we also get Desmin positivity. Some cytokratine expression which helps us to take a call on which uh, is a next panel we want to put. Like colonic carcinomas will be CK20 positive, stomach will be CK7 positive, lung adenos will be CK positive and uh, CK7 positive and TTF1 positive. And likewise, uh, ovary and adenocarcinomas will be CK7 positive. So for unknown primaries, this helps us a lot. And this is a um, common stain which we use. I wanted to show you this is a breast carcinoma. We have done ERPR and hertinue. 
So ARPR on nuclear staining. So on immunohistochemistry, after adding the secondary antibody and the chromogen, we will get brown color. And we use a hematoxylin as a uh, like counter stain, which is a blue color. So the positive stain is picked up by this brown coloration. So the tumor cell is positive for brown. That means it has uh, it's positive for the antibody which we want to test. And this is PR. That is also a nuclear stain. And this is Herchenew, which is a membrane staining. So we can see the membrane has taken crisp, dark brown stain. And this is just a summary of uh, the different stains system-wise, which we can use when it is an unknown primary. And this is my team of the technicians, which help us to get the beautiful sections. And whenever I tell them to do a uh, fast track, any case, they help me a lot. Thank you for a present hearing. And I would like to take the questions now. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic uh, talk. You can open the question and answer quickly. We can uh, wind it up. Can you see the uh, question and answer section? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, quickly we'll go through and end it. Yeah. See, for the students, I want to say there are two types of uh, doing FNA, uh, cytoplasmic features and nuclear features. Uh, whenever you take a syringe uh, with a uh, hub, remember one is you do with vacuum. That would always draw a lot of blood also. So you may miss a lot of uh, cytoplasmic future. Then you take only the needle without a syringe and only non-vacuum needle you pass multiple times. Then connect the syringe and spray it. So always remember one is vacuum, non-vacuum, two both. Just take the needle and give multiple passes. Then from, for, you know smear it onto the slides before you put in poplin jar. And other one is vacuum. This is one. Second, everywhere we use H&E uh, and pepinicol, uh, but uh, in thyroid, MCG stain is something which is used. Micra, uh, you know, stain is something very, very important. Microhyl stain. And uh, you must know that when you look at a uh, uh, IHC, most of the time the standard IHC look a brownish color rather than the red and blue. And in exam, we always ask when you use hematoxyl neosin. Uh, the nucleus is stained in blue or red, cytoplasm is stained in blue or red. So these are the points which you must know. And the cryostat time, uh, don't send in saline, but just put, wrap it as it is and send it. So Sushmita, the question here is, should we apply suction while taking the sample with two and fro moment? Usually what we follow is, uh, we do needling, as you have rightly said, sir. For thyroid, we will just introduce the needle. As soon as we see a red uh, mark coming on the uh, uh, aspirate side, so we will uh, then take the needle and then push the air through the needle and aspirate the smears. So that helps uh, like you know, to get rid of the unwanted hemorrhage material into the smears. So it is not mandatory to uh, apply suction. Always do both. One with suction, yes. one with needle. Next is, madam, in thyroid nodule FNAC, is there any specific method used? So what number of needle do you prefer uh, for thyroid FNA? The 18 gauge, 16 to 18. Okay. 16 to 18 needle. And yeah, and 23 also helps. Yes, 23 also. 22, 23, also. depending on how, when we are feeling, so, uh, if it is a very cystic and we want to go to the periphery and get more from the periphery, then otherwise mostly it is uh, 22, 23. But uh, uh, needling is the uh, uh, way of choice for yeah, thyroid. Not vacuum needle. Yeah. What is fluid cytology? Fluid cytology, the aspiration cytology which we are taking uh, from pleural fluid, aspirate, uh, as a ascitic fluid, pericardial fluid which we get. So that we mostly receive from uh, on the ward here, and it is done on by radiation uh, uh, intervention radiology department and sent to us. And so then we get biopsies. We take the cytology. You can centrifuge, allow the sediments. Then yes, you make the block. So it is, uh, then you can do sometime IHCs or further advanced test if you don't have enough tissue. Even though this is not the best modality, then you can convert a fluid cytology into a sort of you know specimen. I have shown that case of 85 year old, which was a cell button, and we have done a CK7 and 20 on that. Super. So that helped, yes, sir. Should we cut large specimens while putting in formalin? The answer is, yes. uh, you know, if somebody is doing a CA breast, say mastectomy, and uh, that is the first case in the morning, and if it is in a government institution, all the specimens are kept at the end and they come. 
and the tumor tissue breast cancer tissue is not bathed in formalin so if it if you cannot send the specimen within 45 minutes to pathology should we keep a slice so the formalin goes into the tumor and erpr is not lost what is your message yes sir we have to immediately nick as i was telling because cold ischemic time has to be as minimum as possible because otherwise hertonio pr will get affected and then maybe a hertonio positive case we will wrongly give as a negative because of loss of antigenicity so uh, answer is ideally don't cut the specimen let the pathologist do because they have all the information but if you are in a setup where all the specimens are going to go to another building at the end of the day then please keep a cut so the formalin goes into the tumor and whenever you do any surgery like head and neck don't allow them to air dry immediately tell them to put it in formalin and fix it next is ma'am uh, can we comment depth of invasion and cell type in frozen section and depth of invasion it is as pertain to the lesion suppose if it is a uh, endometrial carcinoma so where the cut off is 50% so roughly we can tell okay whether it is less than 50% invasion or more than 50% invasion so definitely it depends on the uh, you know the the specimen and the case which has been sent one more question is uh, madam uh, can we add frozen section margin to final histopathology the example is suppose somebody is doing a tongue case you say and they have sent four edges separately for frozen and in frozen margin is clear now final histopathology margins are not done so can the frozen margin be incorporated into final histopathology report of the final specimen it is done that is the routine practice whatever we do in frozen that uh, blocks i have showed you those chunks will be preserved we do not uh, we always appreciate every tissue is valuable to the surgeon to the clinician and to the patient we do not throw off any tissue whatever we process in frozen we will take it up in the for the permanent uh, assessment of the case plus we use those sections and we give additional sections so that will help us to see whether in any point it was close to the margin or not obviously we have given margin we have assessed but we give more sections so it helps us you know the additional those sections which is given in frozen that will be processed plus additional sectioning of from those areas will also be taken and combined report will be given for the main uh, oncology uh, like no case which will be reported so how do you document margins when margins were positive then we revised so when we get the margin positive we uh, like uh, inked margin the tumor is coming very close then uh, what we will do we will obviously tell the surgeon that it is very close and then adequately the surgeon sends the additional margin so we ink paint and again do a frozen and do that and inform him and all this is documented in the final histopathology If all the document uh, yeah they would have written medial margin positive and frozen revised margin sent is not to be negative so both are documented there it's yes, very sir. important to that nothing is hidden they will not uh, so it both are mentioned it was one was positive then we revised uh, one more question from rajat raja raja bhagat is madam in ca breast sample for fish analysis for her to new report was unsatisfactory due to poor probe hybridization what does this mean ma'am what should i interpret like so if they say they couldn't achieve the fish for her to new because of poor hybridization what does that mean was there a sample error or technical error machine error what was that so maybe in that uh, tish, as we were telling if the um, sample was not processed properly mainly if it is not fixed properly then what will happen they will not be able to get proper uh, like no uh, fish testing on that so fixation is very important if it is not fixed properly later later even if we repeat fish we will not be able to get a uh, adequate result on that okay thank you very much sushmita you know so many doubts but fantastic talks take my word most of the students who are logged in today 250 i am sure 240 first time in their life saw the pathology lab inside because for surgical onco student we send them for posting that is a vacation posting they go around enjoy their life and then they come back in exam they get caught because they would have never uh, known see some of the question we ask is how is ortho pentogram done nobody goes and see that the gantry of the opg machine moves they don't know cryostat temperature god knows because they would have never visited these particular departments 
so and we ask how is interstitial brachycephalic therapy done they don't know because they have never visited thank you very much you have taken a lot of pains to do it we are whole heartedly thankful to you grateful to you superb session very practical you took us through the whole posting of oncopathology thank you very much have a nice thank day you. over to navneet singh ji thank you sir thanks thank you thank you very much dr sushmita rakshit for the presentation and thank you very much professor dr somashekar for joining us and thank you trainees for joining us thank you sir thanks thank you thank you sir